This is Seppel Podcast number eight with me, Remy Miller. And today we're covering a book which I initially had some reticence about because it's it's one of those books that's so popular that you think there has to be some amount of exaggeration or extra hype around this thing than is warranted. So that is the reason why I avoided for quite some time actually intentionally reading The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey because I thought it was one of those books. I thought I was going to be disappointed by it and that it was just going to have some silly rules in here that you probably already know and it, you know, it it's... A low value, you know, not that you're not going to get anything out of it, but probably going to be a low value book, um, especially when it's got the like the number one national bestseller on there. It's like, hey, if it, if it made nationwide, that probably means there was something about it that made it that universally appealing. But at the same time, there are lots of other books that uh, that can pop that on their cover, which um, at least in terms of my preferences, I would rather read something else. But uh, this this came much to my surprise, and I enjoyed this book, and um, it, it was funny because I was learning some of the exact same lessons that other people were reading in their books at the time. So uh, this is this is a book I I remember that, and you know, as we read a book, there's kind of one th- one primary thing that you remember from it each time. And uh, there, there are about two or three for this one where if you're to say, oh, tell me what you know about the seven habits of highly effective people, you know, I wouldn't be able to recite the book, but I would certainly be able to, to come up with, with a, a handful and which I think speaks to the, speaks to the, to the effectiveness of the words on these pages. So let's begin here. To focus on technique is like cramming your way through school. You sometimes get by, perhaps even get good grades, but if you don't pay the price day in and day out, you never achieve achieve true mastery of the subjects you study or develop an educated mind. Did you ever consider how ridiculous it would be to try and cram on a farm to get to plant to forget to plant in the spring, play all summer, and then cram in the fall to bring in the harvest? The farm is a natural system. The price must be paid and the process followed. You always reap what you sow. There is no shortcut. And I I read, I read this book probably, um, I want to say about five books, five or six books after I read about face. And that was the one, one of the prominent themes in about face is that there are no shortcuts. The, uh, another, and and another book that I haven't read, but listened to uh, a podcast of, um, I'm, I'm not sure what it was called. It might've been called strategy. And essentially the sentiment was the long way round is the shortest way home. Because if you try and go about taking the direct road everywhere, you're going to be ambushed by things that you're not expecting every single time, because the direct route is almost, it's, it's almost direct for a reason. I view the direct route as the, as the alarm signal, you know, when you, when you see that perfect, that, that perfectly paved road with, with beautiful flowers planted on the side and, and an apple tree at every corner, you know, that's, that, that's the one that's enticing you the most, enticing you the most, which to me signals warning. There is something going on here that if you go down this road, you're going to, you're going to pay for it in the end. Um, and it's, it's taking the easy way. It's taking the shortcut. But when you go the long way around first, when your initial reflex is, hey, let me take the indirect route. Let me uh, let me make sure I do it right the first time. That's when you start. That's what. That's when things become easier in life in general. And this is the case in if it's some type of hobby you have, or relationship, or or a project at work you're managing, or really anything. It applies. No shortcuts. As literally anyone worth listening to has said, 
what what I'm learning professionally. It's what I'm learning professionally too. It won't get done without it getting done. So do it. It can often be, it's often unpleasant, though immensely more pleasant than the easy way, which is which is longer and harder. The easy way is longer and harder. And it's it can be really difficult to remember that sometimes because we can try and take those take those shortcuts in life too. I notice that when I'm at my at my worst points is when I have lapses in my in my self-care routine. So that being my my reading and exercising in the morning. And when I skip on that is when I start to notice my insecurities arise more easily and more frequently and that affects my relationships with other people by myself becoming more defensive and less trustworthy and i i notice that it it literally has an effect on me so that's why i i don't i don't uh, fall into those lapses often but it'll happen where there there will be a week that goes by where i don't do my full reading reading routine like i i have i have set up about how much not about how much exactly how much reading and how much exercising i'm going to do in the morning before before i start the work day and when i don't some, sometimes i'll 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 my sleeping schedule will be will be thrown off and so i won't do the full routine and it just it just ends up poorly so that is one domain in which i've come to understand the fact that there are no shortcuts you can't do you can't do a half measure on your you can't read half the amount of time and exercise with half the amount of effort and still be as functional and still be as competent as a human being just you know being be, being nice to yourself and others so it is it is certainly the shortcuts which cause the most pain and that happens too in conversations imagine you're talking with somebody and and you want them to understand your point so you say okay the reality is and you try and break it down for them and explain to them what the re- what the reality of the situation is of course the reality as you see it and then instantly defenses are going to go up. So you really got to be careful with that, and, um, and noticing yourself when you're when when those when that arises when when your dark side begins to exude strongly from inside of you, and then actually escapes the barrier of your skin. That's when things are going to start to go wrong. So notice it when when they when they arise. And that will help you so much because then in a conversation, because people can tell these things, they can sense these things. So if you're having a conversation with someone and this is this darkness is seeping out of your skin, they're you know, you're going to be annoyed by them cuz you're going to be saying, "Hey, why are you acting this way? Why are you saying this and that? Why are you treating me in this way? It's it's not, you know, it's unjust." And a lot of times that just comes from your personal security and respect for the other person in that moment. So it's something very much to be careful of. So back to the book here. But at that moment, I valued the opinion of those parents had of me more than the growth and development of my child and our relationship together. I simply made an initial judgment that I was right. She should share and she was wrong in not doing so. So what was happening here was that he was at a, at a gathering of some sort and the adults and the children were there and and her and and his daughter, Kovi's daughter, was being uh, essentially being stingy, not wanting to share. So he was trying to intervene. Back to the book. Perhaps I superimposed a higher level expectation on her simply because on simply because on my own scale, I was at a lower level. I was unable or unwilling to give patience or understanding, so I expected her to give things. In an attempt to compensate for my deficiency, I borrowed strength from my position and authority and forced her to do what I wanted to do. 
But borrowing strength builds weakness. It builds weakness in the borrower because it reinforces dependence on external factors to get things done. It builds weakness in the person forced to acquiesce, stunting the development of independent reasoning, growth, and internal discipline. And finally, it builds weakness in the relationship. Fear replaces cooperation and both people involved become more arbitrary and defensive. So this is a situation where you're trying to, and this is a parent-child situation. The parent is saying, I'm the parent here. Therefore, you have to respect what I'm saying. Therefore, you have to do what I'm requesting. And that's him borrowing strength from his position as the parent, as supposedly someone who is superior in this instance. But then when you do that, it builds weakness, like he says. That's that's one example that Jocko Willink gives all the time is he says that that that's that's one f- uh, phenomenon of thought that he has to counter frequently in everyday conversations with people is is people saying, yeah, this the people at the company at, the, at my company should just listen to listen to what I'm saying, you know, like the military, you know, they, they just got to k- carry out orders. And he has to explain many, many times every single time that. That's not what the military is like. You, When you look at military literature or just what people in the military say, there's a lot of questioning what's going on, of being, of encouraging, um, the, encouraging the trait of being well-read and studied and reasoning out and, and objecting to things when you disagree with it. That's one of the fundamental maxims of combat that even Napoleon talked about, which was, if you carry out an order that you disagree with, you should quit the army. <laughs> that's not the exact quote, but that's what he said. Because, because if you are choosing to go along with something which you don't think should be done, you are equally as culpable. So you have to take responsibility for that. And you can take responsibility for that at work by not, not, not thinking that people should just follow orders and you respect what other people are saying and take their opinions. Um, You can take it in your personal life um, as directly relatable to yourself because because it's not just about, it's not just about forcing. It's not just about forcing things upon people. And it makes me think of a, of a, of a relationship between two people that I'm, that I'm familiar with where one there was kind of a balance in this situation between um you know in, in this in these in this the, these two people that I know it is a it is a, another parent child example and there is a balance here that has to be struck between letting the child do their own thing and and the parent having that that you know, being being imposing to some to some degree or another, um, and it's important to modulate. So, for, in this example, you know, it's important to modulate toughness enough based on the child, because some people are going to need some. Some people are going to meet, need more external discipline and influencing throughout their time growing up. And others are going to need less. That's just the reality of the situation. People are driven differently. They have they have different motivations, etc. Um, so it's not there is not a general application. I will be this direct, or I will be this indirect with all people. That's not going to work out because when you have that, you're there. You're going to hit a certain demographic of of people that will respond to your particular your idiosyncratic balance of of being direct to being indirect to taking the long way round. Uh, but you're going to get these extremities on either end of the bell curve that aren't going to match what you're trying to do. So you need to modulate per person and, and appeal to the ego of each individual and what they care about, what they want, what they think, how they behave. And when you consider the other person more than yourself, your interactions are going to go a lot smoother. That's something I've noticed in myself. When I, when 
when I try to cater as much to the preferences of the other person as feasible, that's when things go better for me. Because what's ha- this is what's happening there. You're creating a negotiation in that, in that uh, event or context in the relationship. And when you're having that negotiation, a negotiation is a balance between give and take and understanding um, and being empathetic and and standing your ground, but also being able to being able to compromise with them. So what I try and do is err on the side of compromise. I try to make things about my ideas or about me as very little as possible, especially when it comes to something like a, a workplace or or individual relationship situation. Um, at the workplace, if you if you and John are well, let's let's go with the author of the book. If if you and Stovey, uh, um, sorry, I, I just completely portmanteaued his first and last first and last name, Stephen Covey. When you're sitting there with Stephen and you're talking about your idea of how you got to complete this task or get to the goal of this project, and they're throwing out ideas, and in your head you think, okay, that's their idea. What's my idea? You solidify your own idea. And then if there isn't that, if it comes down to, of course, if their idea is better, go with that. But if it comes down to the the two ideas between, between you and Steven becoming about equal, even if, you know, give or take, if even if it's a little less, that that's okay, then go with their idea. Because then you're going to the, the other person is going to have ownership over that idea, over the idea, and they're going to feel more passionate about it and want to actually carry it through, as opposed to it just coming from top down. Then it, it, it's going to feel, like he said, imposing, and you're you're not really going to get very far when it comes to completing the project in general and enjoying your time working with that person because it's going to devolve into a state where they they just do what they're told. And you said, "Hey, you gave me these instructions on on how I have to execute this task. I did that. So you can't complain that it came out any way that you, you know, in in any way that you didn't expect." So it's a matter of erring on the side of the other person because then when the other person carry you know carries through with that plan they complete the task then you can come back to them and say thanks for taking that on what what do you think could improve here and and instead of you giving criticism saying x y and z is wrong and you have to fix it if you genuinely ask a question uh, I, I believe someone was telling me about this that I think it was, I don't know if it was a book or a lecture by Simon Sinek called Good Leaders Ask Great Questions or something along those lines. Um, if that's not exactly it, that's that's essentially what you have to do is first ask a question and then and then go from there. Because if you say, oh yeah, this is this is looking looking good, looks like you put some effort into here, that's nice. What do you think, you know, what what parts of this do you think could use some sprucing up? And they say, "Oh, I could have, I could have, I could have polished off this area over here." And you say, "You know, that's that's a good observation. I also think that it could use, it could use some attention. Why don't you go ahead and do that?" And they say, "Okay." And now it's what they noticed, so they want to try and find the 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 best, the most optimal way to bring that to resolution. And. And then they're going to problem solve as they as they get there because they have to think, they have to figure out, okay, what is exactly the configuration of this problem and how do I reconfigure it so that it's no longer a problem? So uh, yeah, there's going to be more passion behind the, the resolution. And then you have to do less work because they're figuring it out. You have to appear less mean or imposing uh, or as big as you need to be if you're not constantly saying what's wrong or offering offering criticisms. So uh, people want to come to you more, ask for your advice, be more willing to listen to you when you do say something, because think about that. If every time a situation arises, they say uh, you're talking about somebody else's work and 
they, they come to you for feedback or for criticism, you ask them questions so they figure out what's wrong. They're, they're, they're going to be happy to do that. And then the one, the, the one time you say, hey, you know, this, this could use some improvement. This is what I think you should do. And, and of course, not, not saying do this, saying this is what I think you should do. Or it seems to me it would be the best option to et cetera. And, and those interactions are going to go a lot smoother because then they're going to, they're going to listen to you on those occasions. And that is the way to that is the way to command more respect, uh, or to embody respect rather, embody confidence is to the the less you talk, the more people listen is the proportion there. So keep that in mind anytime you you have to offer something to say. If you don't feel like you can add much, then don't. If you're in a in a group of people. And everybody's yammering about something. Let's say there are ten people at this meeting, uh, or or you're just at you're just at a social gathering, having some drinks on the sofas with your friends, and you're all talking about a topic. If you're just quiet for minutes at a time, and then you you chime in with your opinion, I will almost guarantee you, as long as you're in the right group of people. That not even as long as you're in the right group of people, this works almost universally. People will quiet down. <laughs> and it's not because you're saying, hey, listen to me. Hey, I don't feel like you're paying enough attention. It's this guy has clearly sat back and absorbed what everybody else was saying over this amount of time. And he hasn't been stepping on other people's toes. He hasn't been interrupting other people he hasn't been negating what people are are you know negating people's beliefs and telling them they're wrong he's just been sitting back and listening so maybe in combined with his own opinions and you know in combination with synthesizing everything he's heard in these past several minutes he'll probably have something good to say so it's an important skill to practice and it's one that is that is, of course, difficult at first, but gets easier over time because you realize that when you give other people the opportunity to speak, they come out with much more refined and clear thoughts. Because when someone speaks, it is them thinking through the conundrum in their cranium, which they are mulling over. And people aren't going to know the idea that they're trying to express straight off the bat. They have to talk through this intricate web. Um, it, it's, it's almost simultaneously a web and a series because so many thoughts are connected to it off the center node, which is the main point they're trying to make. But it's also sequential because they have to go through that process of hitting every one of those points along the way. I guess it's more like a spiral where it's 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 expansive and occupies a square area but it's also linear and it, and it follow, follows that line to the center and then that's when the point is made and you number 1 you discover that people are a lot smarter than than you gave them credit for and you can learn more from them because they're talking more and they're expressing more of their experiences and ideas so you can learn more either about the individual themselves or about or about a uh, specific uh, an idea in general so that's why it's important to listen back to the book here the personality the personality ethic tells me there must be some new book or some seminar where people get all their feelings out that would help my wife understand me better or maybe that it's useless and only a new relationship will provide the love I need. But but is it possible that my spouse isn't the real problem? Could I be empowering my spouse's weakness and making my life a function of the way I'm treated? Do I have some basic paradigm about my spouse, about marriage and about what love really is that is feeding the problem? Can you see 
how fundamentally the paradigms of the personality ethic affect the very way we see our problems as well as the way we attempt to solve them. Whether people see it or not, many are becoming disillusioned with the empty promises of the personality ethic. As I travel around the country and work with organizations, I find that long-term thinking executives are simply turned off by psych-up psychology and motivational speakers who have nothing more to share than entertaining stories mingled with platitudes. They want substance. They want process. They want more than aspirin and band-aids. They want to solve the chronic underlying problems and focus on the principles that bring long-term results. And this is exactly what we're talking about, long-term results. We're looking for the long way around. And I reckon this is, this is why I can be as pensive and contemplative as I am because you never know what personality trait or value of yours is reading off the wrong map. You need to self-reflect. You don't know. You, you could be navigating a territory. So, so this is the analogy here. Going, going with this terrain analogy. You're navigating this terrain, and, it, and in this situation, the terrain is the situation, which I think is, is how it's normally analogized to. And then y- yourself that's walking on this terrain, and yourself that's walking on this terrain is your personality. So pretty straightforward analogy here. Basically, you are yourself, and the terrain is the ground. The terrain is the situation. Every time the terrain reveals an anomaly, so a conversation with someone or an incident at work or whatever it is, you need to, you need to be able to step back. Um, Some people like the word detach. I know some psychologists, it depends on your theoretical orientation, but some psychologists prefer the term defuse. And I believe that that originates from Stephen Hayes, not to be confused with Stephen Covey, the author of this book, Stephen Hayes is a is a pla- is a practicing psychologist that invented ACT or accept- acceptance and commitment therapy, and it's it has that acronym very intentionally because how you change things that are wrong with you, essentially, when you detect something in yourself that isn't quite aligned to what you believe is. A, a, a proper way to believe or act in this or or behave in this world, it is only actions which will change that. It's only actions. That action can be a forthright effort to change your belief structure, belief system. It could be a physical action in the real world. It can be it can be an action of any kind, but it comes at the result of action. That's I was I was reading that, so it's pretty funny. I was I finished I finished the book I was reading, which was On Writing by Stephen King, and then the next book that I wanted to go to get into was the the portable. Sorry, yes, the portable Jung, and edited by by Joseph Campbell. So I wanted to read that one next, but. I had a a lapse of memory and grabbed the wrong one off the shelf and grabbed 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. So I I read <laughs> whatever 15 pages of that and I said, "Wait, didn't I want to didn't I want to read Jung?" So so I ended up doing that. Um and I completely forgot why I why I brought that reference up. Um um, because I was I was talking about Stephen Hayes and and his uh, and how how he invented act and um, yeah it, it's about it's about action that changes things um, you can't go about yes because I was reading Twelve Rules for Life I remember now and he referenced a Jordan Peterson referenced a philosopher from the past who was who talked about being with a capital B and. It was used, that term was used to summarize what it is to exist. You know, what it is to what it is to act as yourself and to believe as yourself. And and what is it that's at the the essence of existing itself? This is, you know, the this the spirit that embodies the personality in a way is the being. 
So you have to take an action for that being to change. And I think that's what this, um, what this bit of the book here is, is reinforcing us to do. And it can never be reinforced enough. That is, again, the lesson I learned from the, bus, the book I recently covered, The Knowing Doing Gap. It is the doing which is important. And actually, the, really the only thing that matters. Because it's great to think. Or it's great to know, but that's that's essentially what intelligence is. You know, intelligence is one of those things that we can measure really well and we understand pretty well, psychologically speaking. But there is there is there's something there to the def the definition of intelligence, which at its at its essence has to be something approximating the following. Intelligence is the application of knowledge. And the more knowledge you have and the more frequently and with the greater variety uh, with which you can apply it, that's essentially what intelligence is. Maybe that's just practicality, but I think the element of knowledge there necessitates that this has to be a, this has to be a comment about intelligence. So, continuing back here, um, he has this, this concept P and PC, and what these, what these stand for, um, I do not exactly remember, so I'm trying to reference it in the, in the book right now. Um, it, is, it is a dichotomy, though, between two, two different, two different um, ways of, ways of managing the self, I suppose. Um, I'm, I'm, I was really trying to find the reference here. So he's calling it the PPC balance, which many people break themselves, themselves against. This principle can be easily understood by rem remembering Aesop's fable of the goose and the golden egg. This fable is the story of a poor farmer who one day discovers in the nest of his pet goose, a glittering golden egg. At first, he thinks it must be some kind of trick, but he starts to throw the egg aside. He has second thoughts and takes it in to be appraised instead. The egg is pure gold. The farmer can't believe his good fortune. He becomes even more incredulous the following day when the experience is repeated. Day after day, he awakens to rush to the nest and find another golden egg. He becomes fabulously wealthy. It all seems too good to be true. But with his increasing wealth comes greed and impatience. Unable to wait day after day for the golden eggs, the farmer decides he will kill the goose and get them all at once. But when he opens the goose, he finds it empty. There are no golden eggs, and now there's no way to get any more. The farmer has destroyed the goose that produced them. So you can see how this, how this analogy is pretty straightforward. And he goes on to talk about how that represents the P slash PC balance. P stands for production of desired results, the golden eggs. PC stands for production capability, the ability or asset that produces the golden eggs. So you have to you have to furnish this balance between production and production capability. If you go too far on the production side, this is, this is a, a great personal example for me, sleep. <laughs> so in this case, that, that is the P slash PC balance. The PC in this case is, is sleep. It is, the, it is the, the thing that is making me capable of production. However, I, I'm not sure. I'm honestly still on the fence at this point about whether I have poor sleep hygiene or I just require less sleep because no matter what, it seems like no matter how early I try to get to bed, I always end up going to bed at the same time and falling asleep. Um, so, so maybe I do need more sleep. Maybe I just require less sleep than the advertised average um, the, the jury is still out on that one. I should do more experimentation, but that, but that is one good example where, where the, the sleep is making me capable of doing that. 
And so it was the physical exercise and the mental exercise with the reading and physical training. Those are the things that allow you to be effective and efficient when you're working throughout the day. So you can't go so far on the side of production that you're eliminating your capability for doing so. The P slash PC balance back from the back to the book is particularly important as it applies to the human assets of an organization, the customers and the employees. I know of a restaurant that served a fantastic clam chowder and was packed with customers every day at lunchtime. Then the business was sold and the new owner focused on the golden eggs. He decided to water down the chowder. For about a month, with costs down and revenues constant, profits zoomed. But little by little, the customers began to disappear. Trust was gone and business dwindled to almost nothing. The new owner tried to des- tried dre- desperately to reclaim it, but he had neglected the customers, violated their trust, and lost the asset of customer loyalty. There was no more goose to produce the golden egg. There are organizations that talk a lot about the customer and then completely neglect the people that deal with the customer, the employees. The PC principle is to always treat your employees exactly as you want them to treat your best customers. You can buy a person's hand, but you can't buy his heart. His heart is where his enthusiasm, his loyalty is. You can buy his back, but you can't buy his brain. That's where his creativity is, his ingenuity, his resourcefulness. PC is treating employees as volunteers just as you treat customers as volunteers. Because that's what they are. They volunteer the best part, their hearts and minds. So it's it's parts like this which make this book powerful. That's what makes this book worth reading is things like this. You're not getting just some motivational speaker that's telling you about how to use schedules to be more efficient or or follow the or follow this this or that method that's going to make you more efficient in every task. He talks about what is it that you have to do regarding your behavior as a human being? which will allow you to have a more robust life, a more full and balanced life. And this is what he's talking about here. Treating, treating your, treating every employee as you want them to treat your best customer. And, and this is, this is kind of where part of the confusion can be because one of the common expressions is treat people as you want to be treated yourself. But part of the problem with that is it should be the inverse of that in a way treat others as they want to be treated because not everybody not not everybody's like you that's a totally that's a totally you know hedonistic egocentric way to think that everybody likes to be treated the way I do so I'm just going to treat everybody the same way it's almost juvenile in a way it's you know it's a good step but the golden rule isn't quite golden. <laughs> it, it really isn't. It's more like, I, I want to use the real name for fool's gold, but it's, it's, it's fool's gold. It's not worth much. You, you can pay a few dollars for it in the gift shop, treating other people as you treat yourself. But for the platinum rule, treat others as they want to be treated because then they, they will feel respected. They will, they will think this person isn't so concerned about themselves that that they're just going to go about their business as they go about it. And if you're along for the ride, then that's cool. And if not, then whatever, you know, that's, that's not, that's not a, a good way to conduct relationships. And that's not, that's not a way to, to contribute to the health of those relationships. That's in fact, going to, going, going to cause an, 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 an eruption, an eruption of imbalance and resentment. In fact, and resentment because then they will feel that the other person will feel less free to be themselves. And nobody wants to feel under the restriction of the hand of someone else. 
people are at everything's core. So whether it is the employee, the customer, or the client, right, treat, right treatment will yield optimal results. Production will come following proper trust and interdependence. You can persuade, but only encourage and correct. You cannot persuade, but only encourage and correctly model for others. Direct versus indirect there essentially is what we're talking about. Because production capability there is is really vocabularily different, but philosophically congruent, identical to something like leadership capital. Leadership capital applies in every instance in which you're interacting with another person. It's not just about, oh, leader, so it's something that's corporate, that's corporate or business-centered. You're a leader every moment of your life, whether you are or not around people, because it is how you, it's how you have to eat, act even in the absence of others, which determines the content of your character and the integrity of your intent. So leadership capital is this concept of having so much in the bank that you can act in a certain way. So if you, you have to go through these indirect, that's why you use the indirect method. It really comes to the benefit of yourself because when you use the indirect, you're building up capital. You're having the other person trust you more. And ultimately when you need it, when you need it most, you can say, okay, I have some cash in the bank. I can use a lump sum of that cash right now to solve this problem. There, there can be some type of chaos that's going on and you say, hey, do this now. And, and when you've accrued the respect of others, they'll say, oh, dang, they're, you know, he's just coming out and making it a direct order. That must mean that th this is important. He doesn't have time to explain. He doesn't have time to get us on board. This is an absolutely urgent and important issue we need to address and we need to do it in exactly the way that he said. And when somebody feels like their opinion and preference for doing something is respected in, in 95 other percent of instances, I don't know what the actual balance is of how much you have to go for the other person versus yourself. But, but when the majority is in their favor and then all of a sudden they hear something like that, man, that makes a, that makes a huge difference in, in how much they're willing to actually carry through with, with what you're saying. Um, so it really is an intense, it, there, there's a lot of calculation involved and, and you really have to detach or defuse and which is different from diffusion, defusion, um, is, is being able to, being able to identify, I essentially identify your mind state. Your, your mindset in the current moment, and then be able to change your behavior based on that. It takes an intense self-awareness and self-adjudicating approach to be able to, to pull off successfully. And it's, it's better to do in smaller instances than it is to do in bigger, more significant, more chaotic instances, of course. So start off where you can and then work up from there. And you'll find that over time, you know, I've been on, on, the, on that path, on the, on the way in that category for a couple of years now. And it really is the, the tiny moments that you have to accrue uh, in order to practice this, this philosophy in order for it to become effective. And you know what? It's gratifying every time. It's gratifying every time. So back to the book here. This is where he's talking about proactivity, defining proactivity. In discovering the basic principle of the nature of man, Frankel, which uh, which is Victor Frankel, because, because Covey here mentions man's search for meaning, which is podcast number three possibly so you can go check that out if you if you want to know the background victor frankel was a practicing clinical psychiatrist then became then was arrested 
and became a prisoner in Auschwitz as well as many other sites during World War II and later on continued to practice. And so and so his book is broken down into two parts, which is essentially the first half is his experience in the camps and the second half is his clinical experience. And he uses his his real life experience as justification and explanation and basis for the theory of his uh, theoretical orientation, which is which is logotherapy. Um, and that that may that may be, if not the basis, one of the definite influencing factors of accept acceptance and commitment therapy act because that's what logotherapy was about it was about seeing at looking at what is it in the moment that's causing my behaviors what's what's actually what's actually what's actually affecting how i think and act right now and then what actions can i take to counteract that it's all about action so so that's what he's talking about here and discovering the basic principle of the nature of man Frankel described an accurate self-map from which he began to develop the first and most basic habit of a highly effective person in any environment, the habit of proactivity, which I'll just continue here. While the word proactivity is now fairly common in management literature, it is a word you won't find in most dictionaries. In fact, the words in fact are not there. It means more than merely taking initiative. It means that as human beings, we are responsible for our own lives. Our behavior is a function of our decisions, not our conditions. That's what Franco says. He says, he says, decision is independent of condition. I believe, again, I believe that's a quote, but don't quote me on it. You can subordinate, we can subordinate feelings to values. We have the initiative and the responsibility to make things happen. Look at the word responsibility. Response. Ability, the ability to choose your response. Highly proactive people recognize that responsibility. They do not blame circumstances, conditions, or conditioning for for their behavior. Their behavior is a product of their own conscious choice based on values rather than a product of their conditions based on feeling. Because we are, by nature, proactive If our lives are a function of conditioning and conditions, it is because we have, by conscious decision or by default, chosen to empower those things to control us. This relates to, so I really like that part in the book there, and this really relates to a a concept in psychology, um, now that we're on the the topic of psychology, talking about Viktor Frankl, of uh, inner versus external. Innerverse outer or innerverse external locus of I think it's yeah innerverse outer uh, locus of control, and that talks about this concept of where it is we understand the 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 source of the of the origins of things are are occurring the or the ongoing events of the world and of life where are they actually coming from what's their cause. And what would be the way to to solve them? So you can so it's it's the difference between saying between pointing the finger at other things and taking responsibility yourself. So instead of saying instead of saying I have back problems all the time, it was from it was from this and that, you know, years ago, and now now I just have back problems forever. It's, it's number one, there's probably some, some, some psychology there that is inhibiting your mindset, you know, that's making you think, oh my gosh, I, my, my back is feeling this way, even though it, it it doesn't have to be. And you can kind of just think yourself out of it because that happens where we have these psychosomatic uh, manifestations of stresses and tensions in our unconscious. And we manifest that in our body. So a lot of times it's just uh, taking, you know, taking a hard stare at what it is that is wound up in our body and, and addressing that. Um, so it's a matter of inverse outer locus of control. Are we saying it's this event that happened years ago that's causing my back pain or is it 
you know what? I'm probably not sitting and standing with good enough posture often enough. I'm not exercising as much as I can. I'm not doing yoga poses or physical therapy maneuvers to help strengthen the the muscles around my spine. I'm not making sure I have a balanced diet to support bone health. I'm not, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's looking at all of these elements and seeing what is it that I can do to optimize my condition so that this, so that this, a problem I'm having comes to a better resolution. My personal development has revealed such to be the case. Changing situations from inside out is more harrowing, more harrowing, but more permanent than the alternative. I can't imagine a situation in which the latter ought to supersede the former. I, I can't think of really any such, any circumstances where it would be better to have an outer locus of control than an inner locus of control. Back to the book here. In the great literature of all progressive societies, love is a verb. Reactive people make it a feeling. They're driven by feelings. Hollywood Hollywood has generally scripted us to believe that we are not responsible, that we are the product of our feelings. But the Hollywood script does not describe the reality. If our feelings control our actions, it is because we have abdicated our responsibility and empowered them to do so. Proactive people make love a verb. Love is something you do. The sacrifices you make, the giving of self, like a mother bringing a newborn into the world. If you want to study love, study those who sacrifice for others, even for people who offend or do not love in return. If you are a parent, look at the love you have for the children you sacrificed for. Love is a value that is actualized through loving actions. Proactive people. Proactive people subordinate feelings to values. Love the feeling can be recaptured. This is extremely important and, and something I, I certainly find in my personal relationships, in my personal intimate relationships, is that is that when you rely on love to be a feeling, nothing that you want to happen is going to happen. It has to be it has to be based on action, not based on feeling. It has to be what am I going to do to nurture my relationship with this person? Because your entire life is a series of actions. From one second to the next, your entire life is a series of actions. So it's about looking at that sequence and saying is my sequence contributing to the health of this relationship right now or is it detracting from the health of the relationship right now? And I know that as a person, I very much have I very much have a tendency to see in black and white, to see in pure dichotomy. But I think this is one of those instances where it's it's valid and actually instructional to think so because think about it like this. Anything, anything you're doing, your, your action is affecting your relationship. And even when it's not in the presence of the other person, because you could be doing things without their absence. So let's say you're in a relationship and every, and outside when you're in direct contact with the person, you're just doing the, the worst things you can imagine for your well-being. You, you're a raging alcoholic and you don't look after your personal health. And you're not making positive efforts in your professional life in order to stabilize yourself financially. You're, you know, you're doing all these things. What are the chances that you're going to be able to conduct a successful relation, relationship, right? So, so all those are all those are a compilation of actions. So it's about looking at your compilation of actions over time and thinking, okay, your action could do one of three things. It can be contributing, benefiting the health of the relationship. It could be, it could be on the border, could be neutral, not doing much for it, or it can be detracting from it. And think about it this way. Your action, your, your, what your personality is, is a series of actions over time. And that, that, that comp, that compilation again 
to use that word because it's really what these all are is a compilation of things. Your compilation of actions is what defines your personhood. So when your compilation of actions is contributing neutrally to the relationship, but at the same time, as it always is, time is passing, then it's actually regressing. The relationship is actually regressing because as time goes by, you have to account for time going by as as the relationship degrading because you know think about it if you don't interact with someone let's say you don't talk to someone for six months every day is a day in which it declines so it's the the health of a relationship is always declining and you have to put more into it than is coming out of it that's really what what a relationship is so Pro- proactive people make all problems and operational complications into verbs. They see speed bumps as opportunities for action. So take it, take them all, and life will transform even uh, into even more than what you wanted. Back to the book. Undoubtedly, there have been times in each of our lives when we have picked up what we later felt was the wrong stick. Our choices have brought consequences we would rather have liked without. If we had the choice to make over again, we would make it differently. We call these choice we call these choices mistakes, and they are the second thing that merits our deeper thought. For those filled with reg- with regret, perhaps the most needful exercise of proactivity is to realize that past mistakes are also out there in the circle of concern. We can't recall them, we can't undo them, and we can't control the consequences that came as a result. As a college quarterback, one of my son- one of my sons learned to snap his wristband between plays as a kind of mental checkoff whenever he- whenever he or anyone made a a setting back mistake. So the last mistake wouldn't affect the resolve and execution of the next play. The proactive approach to a mistake is to acknowledge it instantly, correct, and learn from it. This literally turns a failure into a success. Success, said IBM founder TJ Watson, is on the far side of failure. But to but not to acknowledge a mistake, not to correct it and learn from it is a mistake of a different order. It usually, usually puts a person on a self-deceiving, self-justifying path, often involving rationalization, rational lies to, to self and to others. This second mistake, this cover-up, empowers the first, giving it disproportionate importance and causes for deeper injury to self. It is not what others do, or even our own mistakes that hurt us most. It is our response to those things. Chasing after the poisonous snake that bites us will only drive the poison through our entire system. It's better off to take measures immediately to get the poison out. (laughs) That's essentially what proactivity is. And he puts it very nicely there. It's a great analogy at the end. Chasing the snake after after the venomous injection. Eruption. I learned that word today. So I kind of just want to use it more. Eruption. Is, is what's going to is what's going to generate this cyclical process of more problems. Uh just just as you would expect from chasing a snake after the bite. Uh, success being on the far side of failure. Long way around is a short way home. We've the, the 100th time today that we've learned this and for good reason because it's it's never worth forgetting. When a failure begins to compromise your mood and willingness to maintain discipline, remember that on the other side of this is success. If you if you make it so, stop stop perseverating on that which is perpetuating the self-defeating attitude. 
that's essentially what an insecurity is, is you're saying, oh, this is, this is why I'm bad. This is why I can't do this right. This is why people don't like me. And when you perseverate on that being the case, that's when you start to embody that even more, which is, and I, I mentioned this and I'm, and I'm speaking on this in the, in the manner that I am, because that was my experience of this week. I was totally, I was totally just enveloped in this mental badness. And, and I feel better now. And that was literally when I started sticking to my everyday routine again, when I started waking up at the time that I wanted and reading for the amount of time I I have set out uh, and reading and exercising for the amount of time that I have set out and being sure that I accomplish everything in my morning routine before getting to anything else. And my, my mood and personal personal affect is so dependent on that. It's crazy. And it makes me think, how much of a better world would we be in if, if everybody stuck to what it is that they wanted to do first thing and maybe not? Yeah, you know, I'm even going as far as far to say first thing in the morning because I want to be lenient and say and say, oh, yeah, if everybody if everybody did what they wanted to do in general uh, and 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 fulfill, you know, whatever that that is, in this case, for me, it's it's mental and physical fitness so reading and exercising but maybe that i mean that 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 should really be the case for everyone 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 should be reading and everyone should be exercising those are the two things that are going to benefit you across every domain uh, and along every axis in your entire life there you there there i can't think of a single career or situation or or combination of any number of influences which would be negatively affected by the members participating in that reading and exercising often. <laughs> I, I, I can't think of one instance where that would do bad to the situation going on there. So I, I am going to put that out there. Uh, also, first thing in the morning, because because it really helps. I was just talking to someone recently where that's one thing that they struggle with is is exercising because they do it after work. And it's one of those things where where you you get off of work, you return home and you just had your entire you just had your entire work day. You want to chill out. You want to you want to eat dinner, you want to sit down on the couch and do this or that. And you have to drag yourself at the door out the door and I have to do that in the morning too, but I think it's in my personal experience, it's a lot easier to do it first thing in the morning. And then I'm just so stress-free for the entire day because not only did I get that out of my system and I have that confidence from accomplishing something physical, but I also I also don't have to stress about it later. I don't have to think, oh God, now after work, I have to go and exercise and I have to fit that into the schedule. And I, there are these, there, there are these two things that popped up today that now I have to do after work and I got to cram it in and, and you can put it off or you can be up, you know, begrudgingly drag yourself out the door. So I'm even going, going to go as far to say as wake up as early as you can and do those things. Now, everybody has a different schedule. Um, there is no prescription for what time you have to wake up at in order for it to be effective. It just, it just has to be as early. It just has to be as as early as it as as early as it you can as you can make it. And this is what is is what it constantly feels like to know your why, because you have a good reason based on good principles. You're happy to execute the decision because it's somehow contributing to long term prosperity. And that's another thing about that's that's helpful with me about doing these things in the morning is that I know that no matter what reading and exercise is going to be good for me. So it's the first few hours of my day, which I can in a way coast through. I can turn off my brain. Of course, when I'm reading, I'm actively reading and taking notes and thinking about what I'm reading and when I'm exercising, I'm I'm 
tuning in on that mind body connection as much as I can. But because I know there are things that I should be doing and there are things that I know that I want to do at the beginning of the day, you know, I'm doing it at the right time, I'm doing the right things, then my brain can settle into a state which is it, it's really just this lack of tension that that allows me to to think and be clearly. Back to the book here. Dr. Charles Garfield has done extensive research on peak performers, both in athletics and in business. He became fascinated with peak performance in his work with, Na with the NASA program, watching the astronauts rehearse everything on Earth again and again in a simulated environment before they went into space. Although he had a doctorate in mathematics, he decided to go back and get another PhD in the field of psychology and study the characteristics of peak performers. The, on the on the on the down low, that's something that's kind of appealing to me. <laughs> I kind of, you know, I, I I do have an advanced degree as it is, but there there has been a couple of factors in my life which has been wanting me not now because I still have student loans to pay off, but later in life going back and becoming a doctor and, and getting a doctorate. And if anything, I think I would do that in psychology because based on based on both the books that i read and my general interests and my general mode of thinking and how i like to approach the world and the complexities therein psychology would be the degree that helps me most it's about understanding human nature and every single thing about what you do is based on human nature because you're interacting with someone everything is done in a group setting and even when you think about, even if you're a, a truck driver, you could be a truck driver and you and not getting that much interaction, but you still benefit from being psychologically literate because you can think about yourself as another person because you're not only yourself today, but you're 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 yourself tomorrow across the rest of your life. So you're a community of people. So when you can understand a community of people, that's when you can really bring the most benefit to it, which means you can bring the most benefit to yourself. And I think in the way that my career is shaping up, having that knowledge would be immensely beneficial. And I think I would also just enjoy it. So, so back to the book, finishing up this point here. One of the main things his research, research showed was that almost all of the world-class athletes and other peak performers are visualizers. They see it. They feel it. They experience it before they actually do it. They begin with the end in mind. Oh, my God. This is something that relates to me immensely because this is how I feel all the time. You know, I'm someone that that people describe me as very extroverted but a lot of times i really don't feel like that i i i have these inclination you know this proclivity towards towards staying to myself or towards not meddling in the in the situations of others and i think it's just a result of my own insecurity but a lot of times that's that's the case. And, uh, you know, I, I want to keep to myself sometimes. At the same time, I love talking to others and and learning from them and, and hearing their experiences and because people have so much to offer. So so I, I love talking to people on really on really almost you know, on really every occasion. It's it's worth it. Um, but this is something that I do because I do have that that uh, trait within me. Where before, you know, if I'm not in the middle of a conversation, I, I like to think about and plan what I'm going to say. Because it's almost like role playing. Role playing with the self. I, I talk to myself a lot and much of, that, the, much of that proportion of talking to myself is out loud uh, if it's in a context which, can, which is permissible and tolerant of that. Uh, whether whether I'm home alone or it's just or it's just me and my roommate 
and and he's upstairs, I'm downstairs. I'm not going to be bothering him too much. Sometimes I do it anyway. We're we're comfortable with each other, so so we can do that. And it's it's role playing through situations. It's okay if I have this conversation with this person about let's say it's something that annoys me about someone. Um uh say some trait that they've had over time. I've noticed a few instances of them doing it in the past two weeks. And so I want to bring it up and I will just talk through that with myself. I predict what they might say and be like, Oh man, I I try and come up with the most incisive things that they could possibly say the most negative, the most virulent, all of these, all of these uh, possible worst case scenarios so that when it happens, I know how to mitigate my own reflexes and reactions. Because if they say something that I didn't expect, I could have this emotional flare up and then I could, boom, I could cause a, an even bigger problem. And when you're bringing someone up to someone, you're the one, in a, in a sense, bringing attention to the problem in the first place. So you're already, you're already on on the fence in their mind they're all re- there's already a slight amount of defensiveness popping up in the other person and and the erecting of that defense is going to thwart your efforts so you have to be as accommodating to that as possible and part of maintaining detachment and defusion is being able to to handle that in the moment at the same time it's being prepared for that moment so, so that preparation is helpful for me. And I suppose then that the conscious is as strong as the unconscious regarding representation and projection. The end in mind clarifies each step along the way. Solidify the whole point of a goal, which is to achieve it. So when you're anticipating doing something, in this case, going into space, you need to you need to put your mind in the state of doing that. And that is when that is when you're going to achieve the most effectiveness in that activity, whether it's an upcoming conversation with someone or it's an actual physical action. That's one thing that I think helps me really. I I achieve things sometimes that I did not th- expect myself to be able to achieve. I set out the goal. I I it's a goal that that I think is even more absurd for myself to do than other people tell me how absurd it is. And I put it out there and then I do it and then I actually complete it and I think it comes from this what if mentality. It could be what if I do this and that's that's where I've borrowed this concept of recertification from, from David Goggins. And it's really helped with giving it because I, I remembered, you know what? That is something that I remembered when I was in the shower two, I believe it was two nights ago when I was in the throes of my insecurities of this week. And, and that's something I remembered. I thought, you know what? You, you recertified, you did this. And that was only three months ago. You, it, it, that's the beautiful thing about recertification too, is when you do it once a year, you can always say you did that thing under, you can say, oh yeah, under a year ago, I did this. And that's, that's really powerful to say. So it was three months ago, I did this. And for, for this year's recertification is, there is a piece called Everywhere at the End of Time. I might've, I might've mentioned this and Oh, in fact, this was something I forgot to mention in my podcast on on uh, the 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 woman whose mother uh, got Alzheimer's. The book is called Death in Slow Motion because there is this there is this compilation of six albums called Everywhere at the End of Time, and you can find the whole thing on YouTube. It's six and a half hours long, and it is a piece of music that embodies. A, a guy's experience of, I believe, his grandmother acquiring and being fatally affected by dementia. Pretty powerful stuff. Pretty affecting stuff. It's the most emotionally... 
it's the most emotionally evocative music I've, I've ever heard. Now, in terms of, I guess you would call it regular music, I have I have been never more uniquely affected by the music of Lorn, L-O-R-N. So is my, I suppose is my favorite artist in a way because I've never heard anything like it. My, my favorite, my actual most preferred music and the music I listen to most often is from the band Fonts, F-A-U-N-T-S, Fonts. Uh, so, so those are, those are the, the premier selections there, but there's nothing, there's no singular piece that's more unique and uniquely affecting than is, than is everywhere at the end of time. So I put it out there. I was thinking, and I, and I came up with this idea, I think in the November before the March that I did recertification, it's coming up with the most absurd thing. And then being like, why don't I just do it? Because I didn't know if I wanted to do it. So what it was is using everywhere at the end of time. Six and it's a six and a half hour thing. And to give you some reference, I've suggested many people to listen to it, and many of those people have. The people that have, almost all of them, at about the four four something hour mark, have taken a break and said, "Remy, I can't do this. This is too intense." And and I said, "Trust me, stick it out to the end." So it's it, it's it's big stuff. It's serious business. I said what I'll do is I will do a fasted meditation for 24 hours listening to this thing on loop. So listen to everywhere at the end of time on loop. No food, no water, and I just sat or laid down for 24 hours in my apartment. And that's that's some that's almost like a CIA torture technique in some ways. You know, it, it, it's kind of out there. But I did it. And I thought about that in the shower. I actually did this thing. Whatever insecurities or incompetencies I think I had, I shattered those when I did this bizarre thing and came out the other side just as sane and in fact more sober than before. So it's good stuff. Back to the book here. This is a this this is a a bit of a a beefy excerpt here, but I learned a lot on these two pages. Usually, usually in these books, I have on the page there is there's some part of a sentence that sticks out to me, so I highlight it and then write my thoughts on the sticky. I have one sticky here with four highlights spread across these two pages, so that gives you a little bit of the weight of what's going on here. So. So yes, back to the book. Many families are managed on the basis of crises, moods, and quick fixes, and instant gratification, not on sound principles. Symptoms surface whenever stress and pressure mount. People become cynical, critical, or silent, and they start yelling and overreacting. Children who observe these kinds of behavior grow up thinking the only way to solve problems is flight or fight. The core, of any, the core of any family is what is changeless, what is always going to be there, shared vision and values. By writing a family mission statement, you give expression to its true foundation. The mission statement becomes its constitution, the standard, the criterion for evaluation and decision making. It gives continuity and unity to the family as well as direction. When individual values are harmonized, with those of the family, members work together for common purposes that are deeply felt. Again, the process is as important as the product. The very process of writing and refining a mission statement becomes a key way to improve the family. Working together to create a mission statement builds the PC, production capability, capacity to live, with, to, to live it. By getting input from every family member, drafting a statement, getting feedback, revising it, and using wording from different family members, you get the family talking, communicating on things that really matter deeply. The best mission statements are the result of family members coming together in a spirit of mutual respect, expressing their different views, and working together to create something greater than any one individual could do alone. Periodic review to expand perspective, shift emphasis or direction, amend or give new meaning to time-worn phrases can keep the company united in common values and purposes. 
The mission statement becomes the framework for thinking, for governing the family. When the problems and crises come, so when the problems and crises come, the constitution is there to remind the family members of the things that matter most and to provide direction for problem solving and decision making based on correct principles. Skipping a bit ahead, we review the statement frequently and rework goals and jobs twice a year. So this is what he that's what he does in his own family and and skipping a bit back to the book, mission statements are also vital to successful organizations. One of the most important thrusts of my work with organizations is to assist them in developing effective mission statements. And to be effective, that statement has to come from within the bowels of the organization. Everyone should participate in a meaningful way, not just the top strategy planners, but everyone. Once again, the involvement process is as important as the written product and is the key to its use. So that, that's the end of the, the excerpts on these two pages. And wow, really good stuff there. It's actually something I've implemented in my everyday life. It is something that I've done with the person I'm living with, living with now. It's something that I, that I aim to emphasize more in my intimate relationship. And it is, again, the importance of the importance of reading. Because when you sit down with someone to negotiate, how do I want to be treated and how do I want to treat you and and how you and the other person uh, balance that, negotiate that, if you read more, you'll be able to perspective take more, which means you'll be more understanding and reasonable and clear in, in what you want. And it means that that yeah, you'll just have more lenience and forgiving for forgiveness with the other person. And this this relates to this relates to the the company context also. It is the project team size of around 6 people, but you can get away with depending on the situation 5 to 10, which has the most potential operational effectiveness because unit cohesion is strongest at this size. All the teams should develop a shared mission statement to improve satisfaction with team members, strong identity, and and everlasting motive. And this can happen. This can really happen. And sometimes this is difficult because in the workplace you might bounce from from one project to another. So it's it would be weird or or also impractical to try and set up these mission statement mission statements with each of the people each of the people you interact with but it should certainly be baked into your behavior somehow you need to figure it out for yourself what it, what is your own mission statement and think about whether your actions in that moment are contributing or not to it um so this was funny. This was really funny. Um, I I highlighted just this one sentence because he's talking about he's talking about um, this is habit three. Put first things first. And this one sentence he says, uh, "I am personally persuaded that the essence of the best thinking in the area of time management can be captured in a single phrase." This phrase is. Organize and execute around priorities. <laughs> so that just reminds me of Jocko Willink and what he says. I let my I just wrote a little flag here. It said, "LMAO literally prioritize and execute." Concepts aren't new. These concepts aren't new. You know when when did this book come out? I think it came out in the in the in the late seventies. I have I have one of the one of the original copies too. Uh, so so it's pretty neat. It's very dilapidated and yellow. Um, and it's and it's neat to have this in my hand. So 1990, 1990 is when this first came out, and Jocko Willink is writing is writing the dichotomy of leadership, where where he and Leif Babin wrote about prioritize and execute as one of the laws of combat. In when when did that book come out? 20, 2010s, sometime in the mid 2010s. And of course, this has been written about for thousands of years. Prioritize and execute. That's what you got to do. And this is exactly what I was talking about. Another excerpt from the book here, 
we're, we're looking at this in the, in, in the last annotation. So back to the book. In other words, if you are an effective manager of yourself, your discipline comes from within. It is a function of your independent will. You are a, dis- you are a disciple, a follower of your own deep values and their source. And you have the will, the integrity to subordinate your feelings, your impulses, your moods to those values. Boom. That's what's going on here. And it's funny because Jocko says another, the same thing on his podcast, subordinate your ego. That's what your, your feelings, your impulses, and your moods, that's what your ego is. You have to subordinate those. You have to be able to be able to identify those in the moment or in advance, put them in a box and, and be able to, I'm not saying, I'm not saying hold them inside. I'm saying, I'm saying identify them, label them, see what's going on there, put it to the side if you need to. And understand what's going on inside of that box. Put it aside. Sometimes you do need to put it aside. You need to, you need to, you need to put that back on the shelf. And then you can check that book out later, read it, see what's going on, and then you can process. That's required sometimes. Life is not about carving a path, but about following the correct one. Because the way is set. You must act in accordance to your core values, so you're a follower of them. Though elusively difficult, life is simply a series of decisions. And that that is, I think, self-evident to the concepts we, we talked about momentarily ago. Back to the book here. That's why it's so important whenever you come into a new situation to get all the expectations out on the table. People will begin to judge each other through those expectations. And if they feel like their basic expectations have been violated, the reserve of trust is diminished. We create many negative situations by simply assuming that our expectations are self-evident and that they are clearly understood and shared by other people. The deposit is to make the expectations clear and explicit in the beginning. This takes a real investment of time and effort up front, but it saves great amounts of effort and time and effort down the road. When expectations are not clear and shared, people begin to become emotionally involved and simple misunderstandings become compounded, turning into personality clashes and communication breakdowns. Clarifying expectations sometimes takes a great deal of courage. It seems easier to act as though differences don't exist and to hope things will work out than it is to face the differences and work together to arrive at a mutually agreeable set of expectations. And this is, this is why those contracts, those, those agreements... Those mission statements, as Stephen Covey words it, are so important because whether it's yourself or with others, in this case, it's it's really referring to others, is what is you what are you mutually agreeing to expect? What is in the standard, what is in the standard mode of operating uh, of operations between you and another person? If you don't have that set up, then it's hard to know what is going to be outside the mode of acceptability or inside that range. And and it really requires close attention paid to it. People judge based on what they expect, not what they want. I've I've wanted <laughs> so I'm I'm saving up to get a car. When I, I, I moved, I moved to the city, I moved to downtown from a suburban area. And I said, I'm going to, I'm not going to need a car. I'll just get rid of it. I got rid of it. And now I want a car again. So the, the next car that I want is the Mazda Miata for a variety of reasons. And I've wanted it for quite some time. I've wanted a Miata for years, but it is no factor of stress because I do not expect one for another year from now. An expectation Discussed and violated is just as volatile as one implicitly understood but not mentioned because both are communication failures. So that's what's going on here. You have you kind of, you kind of have a Punnett square of what's assumed and discussed, and if something's assumed and discussed, then then you're in the clear. And if you violate that, that's a big problem. If something is neither 
assumed nor discussed and then it occurs then it comes out of nowhere and you don't and mutually between the other person you don't know how you're going to resolve it so then creates chaos so it's really the two corners of extremes which contribute to to a lack of trust growing in a relationship <clears throat> so it's it's very wise to be to be sensitive to that Back to the book. As a teacher, as well as a parent, I have found that the key to the 99 is the one. Particularly the one that is testing the patience and the good humor of the many. It is the love and the discipline of the one student, the one child that communicates love for the others. It's how you treat the one that reveals how you regard the 99 because everyone is ultimately a one. Again, again, the concept. This is, this is why you are a leader at all times, even when you're not in the presence of others. In this case, he's talking about how you treat people. If, because you can say, oh yeah, you know, 99% of the time I'm, I'm, I'm behaving well in the presence of others and toward others. But in a sense, 99 isn't good enough because it takes it takes that one person to because what it, the, that one exception reveals the exception, which elucidates the rule. What is it that you're willing to tolerate? What is it that you are at your worst going to exude or going to believe if you're having an interaction with a person? And and it is filled with anger and frustration and you're yelling at this person and accusing them and making assumptions and doing all these things that you know are bad for that interaction uh, independently as well as for the relationship as a whole, then, then – you're of course of course you're you're not going to get very far in that interaction and it really talks about what it is you're willing to tolerate in yourself and and i this is this is something that that leif mentions he says that he, he's talking about leadership and he says something along the lines of leadership is not what you preach it's what you tolerate so you can say oh yeah i treat people this way i i'm this good of a person i'm nice i'm benevolent i have integrity of character but then you come across the one person and and, and your threshold your absolutely minimum threshold for how you're going to treat someone that comes out that comes across then that means something about how low you're willing to stoop some people that's a lot lower than others so it is the ex exception that reveals the rule. This is why it's important to have discipline in all things. As, as so, I'm I'm really I'm really hitting on the uh, <laughs> on the on the Jocko train here because uh, another person embedded in that circle of Jocko Jocko Willink and Leif Babin is this guy Dave Burke, and. As he mentions, eyes are always eyes are always on the leader. They're always evaluating her integrity and consistency because, as we know, every person is a leader. One must perpetually act with purpose and mindfulness. So there we go. I, and I even notice doing that myself. I notice in situations – Noticing somebody's behavior that I, that I know and and thinking, oh, you know, do they treat me in a similar way? Do they talk to me differently? Things like that. And it's really, it's it tells you, my mom said you tell a lot about a person by the <laughs> conversations with other people, just their interactions with general, you know. So pay mind to that. So I'm just going to I'm just going to hit this one straight with the highlight, no context at all. The highlight here is 
It truly takes more nobility of character to confront and resolve those issues than it does to continue to diligently work for many projects and people out there. So that's that's why it's important to have small teams that understand the mission in a very mutually defined way because that's when you're going to get the best out of people is when they're when they're acting on behalf of the people they know a primary motivation of the small team-based mission statement different from a goal setting structure uh what, what matters most is how you treat the person to the left and right make a difference where the most difference will be made which as we learned earlier is in people in the case of a business, it's in the employees because it's in the in the employees that interface with the customers and clients or patients. So back to the book here. Although they might verbally express happiness for other success, inwardly they're eating their hearts out. So here's ta- here he's talking about the abundance versus scarcity mentality. And this is the trait of, of the people with the scarcity mentality. So, so the difference there is that a person will a person can can have one of these two mentalities where they think there's enough to go around or there's not enough to go around, where everybody can come out on top here. All boats ride. All boats. All boats rise on the same tide. Versus, this is zero sum, and and if I don't look out for myself, then no, then I'm not going to get looked after. So, it's I, I've had this mentality slash behavior imposed to me in previous contexts, specifically at a previous employer. And it destroys teams, this this scarcity mentality. Um, Because back to the book, although they might... Yeah, so, so continuing, their sense of worth comes from being compared. And someone else's success to some degree means their failure. Only so many people can be A students. Only one person can be number one. To supply simply means to beat. Often people with a scarcity mentality harbor secret hopes that others might suffer misfortune. Not terrible misfortune, but acceptable misfortune that would keep them in their place. They're always comparing, always competing. They give their energies to possessing things or other people in order to increase their sense of worth. So that's what was happening to me at the, at this previous workplace where the scarcity mentality and insecurities and likely childhood trauma of the of the person I was interacting with was creating this horribly trustworthy environment. The only child, the the only, and and this person, this person was was an only child, and that doesn't mean necessarily anything because I know lovely people and people that I care about very much, which are only children, Uh, but it it definitely inspires behavior somehow, just like having siblings inspires behavior. And there, so there's no reason that everyone can't have maximal well-being. And it's true that not understanding this tenet signals immaturity. It, It really is immaturity. It really is I am important, and if I don't make myself important, then no, I, I have to make myself important because if I don't, then I'm never going to be important. And if I don't make others less important, I'm not going to be important at all. Having that zero sum mentality is going to destroy every single intimate relationship you want to build. So do not do it, <laughs> please. When you, and this is really captured really well in the show. What is this show? The Midnight Gospel. And 
my my close knit friend group refers to this episode so often we just call it episode 5 we can just we can just literally say episode 5 and we know what we're talking about we don't have to say from the show this or that do you remember when no we just say episode 5 and in episode 5 of this show is I think commonly understood by the community that's watched it as the best episode of the series. And I believe there are 12 and it's about Bob and Bob is in this prison of bad people. These bad people have done bad things. That's why they're there. And he goes through a process of escaping prison and you watch that process that is as much as i want to say because i don't want to spoil any of it at all that's what the episode is about and it applies exactly to what we're talking about here because at at first he had the scarcity mentality it was if i don't look after myself nobody will But he began to learn that the more he looked out for others, the better his life became. And not only the better it became in terms of how people were treating him and how things were working out for him, but also how he felt internally because he became more, he he allowed the sedation of appealing to others to get to him in a good way. He was sedated by his benevolence. And I don't mean sedated as in ushered into inaction. He was still very much proactive in handling his life and his situation. But he he was definitely at a much more intense quiescence uh, regarding regarding his handling of that situation. So back to the book here. He's talking about a company. I have six criteria to meet in this particular department. I was able to pass three of them off with skills I gained from college. I was able to get another another one out of a book. I learned the fifth one from Tom and the, the fellow you trained last week. I have only one criterion left to meet, and I wonder if you or someone else in the department might be able to spend a few hours with me to show me how. So they spent half a day in a department instead of two weeks. So this is what's going on here. He's he's um, he's this chapter chapter is think win win, and he's talking here about what you can do essentially to improve at the workplace. And it's not just saying other people have to other people have to show me the way. It's saying this is the, these are the things that I identify as being part of success. And I've worked, I've worked my way through some of these so far. And I want a little help help polishing myself off. And usually when you have that approach, people are going to be much more willing to help. So back to the book, these trainees cooperated with each other, brainstormed with each other, and they accomplished the additional objectives in a week and a half. The six month program was reduced to five weeks and the results were significantly increased. This kind of thinking can similarly affect every area of organizational life if people have the courage to explore their paradigms and to concentrate on win-win. I am always amazed at the results that happen both to individuals and to organizations when when responsible, proactive, self-directing individuals are turned loose on a task. Boom. That's what you get. These are the people that you want in your organization. Responsible, proactive, and self-directing. So they are, they have the, that spark of initiative to begin pursuing something. They go about that in a way that is balanced and beneficial. And they know how to correct themselves based on their actions as they're going through that process. That's what responsible, proactive, and self-directing is. And imagine if you had an entire group of people that acted Co-linearly in that way towards an objective.
your results will be incredible. So the more you can encourage that in your team is the better you're going to be off generally. And in that team, that team or that organization, again, can be corporate, can be business, can be personal, intimate, anything. Clear goals and decentralized command yields the happiness and most competent workers. Actually sitting down and making decisions about a projected plan with a true vision for a future position or situation spawns the most robust results and the best people. So it's the people that you are gen- that you are uh, addressing here too. Back to the book. One of the most interesting interesting things to me was how little time had inspired tra- excuse me. One of the most interesting things to me was how little time had transpired before there was a su- sufficient trust to create synergy. This is a big concept that he begins to talk about a synergy. I think it was largely because the people were relatively mature. They were in the final semester of their senior year, and I think they wanted more than just another good classroom experience. They were hungry for something new and exciting, something that could create, something that they could create that was truly meaningful. It was an idea whose time had come for them. In addition, the chemistry was right. I felt that experiencing synergy was more powerful than talking about it, that producing something new was more meaningful than simply reading something old. So this is why you can't just read a book like this. You actually have to go out in the real world and practice these. Just as he says that you have to you you have to live your you have to live your paradigms. You have to live your principles. And there's this document that I'm working on now which pertains to in the workplace how one should conduct herself and and it ought to be to invigorate this this synergetic spirit into more and better action the question should be to act not how to inform so that's why it's important Excuse me. That's why it's important to think about how your how your philosophies and principles translate to the everyday. So maybe that would be good. Maybe if if just to put it in a simple example, let's say you're sitting down and you're going to write out all the principles that are important that are important to you. So you write options, not options. You write principles one through five. And then for each of those five, you have three subcategories and 5A, B, and C are going to be what you do in everyday life and on a second to second, moment to moment basis to make that true. So let's say you want to, one of your principles is be, is tell the truth or speak truthfully. Speak truthfully would be a good principle. So, okay, what does speak truthfully mean? That means, what does that mean and what does it feel like? Because you also need to identify what it is in the moment that's causing that so you can so you can actually go about addressing it and course correcting in the moment or later on when you reflect on that experience and learn. So if it's okay, speak speak truthfully. So one, you could say, Don't say things that make me feel weak. Okay, that's probably a good place to start because if you're saying something that makes you feel weak, this is this is that that's some phrasing from Jordan Peterson. Something's up there. There is you're you're causing a dissonance within yourself somewhere where your your head is in one spot and your actions are another spot, and that's a problem because they need to occupy the same space as to maximize their velocity and moving towards the greater good. They need to have a mutually supporting speed that gets them towards the goal. And when you say something that makes you feel weak, that means you're not paying attention to that and you're not speaking truthfully. So that could be A. B could be avoid white lies, you know, maybe in a hostage situation, that'd probably be a good place to 
lie a little bit, even if it's by omission, which many people view as not as bad. But even in hostage situations, you need to speak truthfully because let's say that you make a slip up and it turns out that something you said was a lie. Oh boy, are you going to catch the short end of this stick on that uh, when when the the captor is in, in that captor's behavior towards you? You know, it could start beating you or give you or give you fewer options. Uh, for negotiating your way out of there, whatever it is, you know, maybe becomes more stubborn. So you need to build trust in a situation like that. And in every situation, you need to build trust. So speak truthfully. Back to the book. People then begin to interact with each other almost in half sentences sometimes incoherent, but they get each other's meaning very rapidly. The whole new worlds of insight, new perspectives, new paradigms that ensure options, new alternatives are opened up and thought about. Though occasionally these new ideas are left up in the air, they usually come to some kind of closure that is practical and useful. And this is what communication with a noticeable amount of times feels like with my best friend where we in, sometimes anticipate entire points and conceptualizations that we're talking about. And it, it makes me think about what it's going to be like in my other, in my other intimate relationships uh, or my, my where, where I, I know someone for a very long time what is it going to be like when they get to that amount of years of us knowing each other? It's going to be, it's going to be crazy. And, and then depending on the intensity of that relationship over time, you're going to have different, uh, different, different outcomes and different effects, which is encouraging to work toward. Back to the book. Once people have experienced real synergy, they are never quite the same again. They know the possibility of having other such mind-expanding adventures in the future. Often, attempts are made to recreate a particular synerg synergistic experience, but this seldom can be done. However, the essential purpose behind creative work can be recaptured. Like the Far Eastern philosophy, we seek not to imitate the masters, Rather, we seek what they sought. We seek, so we seek, we seek not to imitate past creative synergistic, exper synergistic experiences. Rather, we seek new ones around new and different and sometimes higher purposes. I, I like what he says there because it teaches you where your focus should be. It shouldn't be trying to replicate other people because then you're simply, you're simply a collection of facsimiles of certain aspects of others and you can't be having that in your life because then then you are a broken glass goblet of visions of a million different things rather than a cohesive person indeed it is not to imitate the master's ways but to participate in what got the masters there it is not to copy but to learn for the self what the master learned you do not you do not look out for and try to try to just copy and paste into yourself what it is what helped other people you're trying to go to where they got those things that's why i again find it so important to read because that's where a lot of people get where they are is by saying it was from reading it was from having this experience which combined with me reading this book that really taught me about how how to be how to behave what type of person i should be and when you're able to access the sources of how other people get there man you you start going you start going far places very fast Back to the book here. It's a good little sentiment. This is a little quickie right here. I'll read just the highlight. All people see the world not as it is, but as they are. And that's, that's a true little quip there. 
because this is one thing I, I think, especially in the realm of advice, when you're getting advice from other person, there is some portion of it that is directly applicable to your situation and how you, sh- how you, how you should go about orchestrating it. And there are others, and I think they are more abundantly th- this way, that it's a reflection of what you think, of what you are. How many times have you given advice to someone and it relates to something that happened to you in the past week or the past month? You know, we, we see we see problems generally through our own lens. And, and it is that lens through which when we see everything, we apply everything. So when someone comes to us with something they're struggling with, then then that's when our self comes out and we really have no choice in it because we can sit there and listen to what the person is saying and really be mindful and really actively not even actively listen i i kind of believe in a way of passively listening is you're not you're not trying to you're not trying to hear what they're saying and come up with your own response as they're talking the aim there is to listen to what they have to say because if you're coming if you're thinking about what your response is going to be then you're simply going to ostracize from your mind the possibilities of what you can understand from the other person first should come description and summary of what the other person's saying and 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 then you will be able to make your own contribution or share your own point. And it's going to be more profound that way too. I found that recently in conversation with my girlfriend and someone else that we met. And this is a very wholesome person. This is a person that has taken the experiences of her life and synthesized them genuinely and thought about what can I do to change as a person to become a more eminently qualified human and how can i learn th- learn more of that from others and how can i and how can i make an inquisition of that stuff on as many others as i can so they can so they can also chew on this food which has given me such strength and health and in that conversation among the three of us there were so many things that each of us wanted to say in that conversation, but didn't, which is a great sign because that means we were all listening to each other and really internalizing what each other is saying. And then we have our own response and we actually want to add more on top of it, but we want to listen to what other people are wanting to say more. We're listening to what they're saying and we come up with an idea. You know, that that happens. You listen to someone, you're an idea suddenly pops into mind of what it is that you are are thinking and you can choose that yeah i'm gonna remember this i'm gonna remember this or you can just say okay if i remember it fine let me let me put that to the side for now let me just listen to what they're saying and there's so many times where we just forgot what that what that was and it never came up and that's really a good sign because that also kind of means you're filtering out you're 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 selecting for the best the best conversation points to have and that's that that's a, that's essential to meaningful conversation and that's really when you're going to build a a strong relationship with a person and this is why my advocation for action is so regular and potent the the inverse of his statement is also true because we are as we see the world Change how you are to change how you see. So maybe you have, you do not have right view of something. That is some, that is something the author and Vietnamese Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh talks about in his book, The Heart of the Buddhist Teachings. Is it, 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 it's a Buddhist, it's a Buddhist tenet concept is right view and there's there's a there's a lot of it's right x you know it's right following something one of them is right view capitalized so if you 
reckon that you do not have right view in a certain moment, what you can do is, is say, okay, instead of just trying to straight up change how I view, let me, let me, let me change how I, how I, how I act. Because people see the world not as it is, but as they are. So, so if you want to, we, we are as we see the world. If you want to see differently, be differently. Is what we learn there. And to cap it off here, we will return to the book with actually a quote from someone else. In the words of George Bernard Shaw. This is the true joy in life, that being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, that being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish, little clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I'm of the opinion that life that my life belongs to the whole community. And as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. For the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me. It's a, it's a sort of splendid torch, which I've got to hold up for the moment, and I want to make it burn as brightly as, the poss- as possible before handing it on to future generations. This is something that I got emotional over a couple times because it's a real poem. I'm not sure by who. I, sh- uh, I should have perhaps committed this to memory on account of how much it's affected me is the poem that's featured in the movie Interstellar. And it's not much of a, spo- of a spoiler. It's said multiple times in the beginning and, and at a couple other locations. It begins off saying, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage at the showing of the light. I got the second line wrong there a little bit. It's not the showing of the light. But that's essentially what's at essence there. Rage, rage at the light and and do not going gentle in that in that into that good night. Into that good night is into death, into darkness, into the unknown. Do not go gentle into it. Because You will end up shortchanging yourself. You will end up not maximizing, capitalizing on what you can get from that. That is what I that that is what encourages me to get out of bed in the morning, to carry throughout my day, to use as every second that I can, to not waste time on things that don't matter. Understanding that discipline equals freedom. It is that. It is saying, I don't, you can die anytime. You can die anytime, literally anytime. Any second it can happen. A tragedy could befall you uh, that's not your death at any moment. You could get a bad phone call at any time of day. Bad news is always potentially on the horizon. So if you are not marching forward with a strength in your stride, then you are wasting the life which you have been so benevolently endowed. Selfishness is pervasive in the idea that One exists in order to flourish, and instead, one should act as if they live in order to be a positive resource for others. Aim to empty the tank. Do not say, I could have done better. I could have tried harder. I could have acted differently. 
I could have been nicer. I could have been more respectful. I could have used my time better. I could have treated myself better. I could have cared for others better. Do not fall into that trap. And as Miyamoto, Miyamoto Musashi says, I will not, what does he say? There's a moment in the book where he goes through three revisions. And I wish I remembered it perfectly in order to have a powerful ending here. But what he, he says that he will live without regret. And it's not that you will never do things that you don't regret, but it is to not hold regret for things that you do. And that's about all that I have here today. So remember that literacy is a superpower. And with that, I recommend checking out Instagram where you can see the actual thoughts that I have on an everyday basis when I'm reading. I, I put my sticky notes up in there and that's, that's where I'm, that's the source of the information that I talk about here. A lot of it because my, my thoughts are right here on the pages. There is a lot that it's, you know, really it's the minority of what I'm talking about when I make a point is, is what's on the sticky note. A lot of it is just extraneous information that I remember and speak about, but the stickies are the source. So if you want the source, check it out. And with that, farewell.